Welcome to the Better Half Show. My name is Godman Akinlabi, PG to my friends. This episode uh, is called Love is Not Blind. And I'm going to be discussing with the multi award winning artist, producer, musician, Kobams Asuko. Uh, we're going to be looking at his love life, his marriage, his relationship, his emotional life, and uh, it promises to be a really fantastic experience. So I want you to stay with me, don't go anywhere. I'll be right back with Kobams Asuko. Welcome to the Better Half Show. It's a special edition. We're discussing the special topic, love is not blind. And uh, for this discussion, I have a very special guest. I'm talking about none other but the uh, multi-award winning artist, producer, musician, Kobams Asuko. Kobams, you're welcome on the show. Thank you, PG. It's great to be here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kovams, this is a relationship show, so let, let's let's start out like this. How long have you been married? Well, that's the, that's so Ojo and I always forget. We always forget when they ask us that question, the exact date, because <laughs> uh, for for us it's interesting. We always think it's like three or four years, but it's seven going on eight years. Wow, yeah, almost so eight years. Almost eight years. It'll be eight years th this December. Wow, wow, wow. That's that's cool. That's cool. I also got married December, so uh, we 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 share the same anniversary month. Yes. Um, so go, going on eight, and very soon it will be a decade. And uh, I'm sure it's been a wonderful experience for you. It has been. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, Kobam, tell us a little bit about your growing up. Um, uh, I mean, uh, everyone knows, almost everyone knows that you're visually impaired. Yeah. Um, were you? born visually impaired yes yeah, so i i was i was born blind um i grew up in i grew up in the military barracks it was a very interesting place i'm um, very eventful you know all kinds of things happened i grew up in you know a small a small block of about 18 flats wow. and um yes yeah, so there was a lot of people to interact with from different parts of the country you know, naturally, the military and posting and all that. So the interaction was very, very vast and also very, very exciting. Um, it, it, it was a great neighborhood in terms of how people interacted, but it wasn't like, you know, a, a, a place of wealth or anything like that. It was, it was a very, very interesting place. Um, but it was exciting for me because it helped me learn. You know, I ran around, played with kids. You know, were those kids that used to roll tires on the streets and stuff <laughs> like that. So it was, it was very exciting. Growing up for me was exciting. I did everything I was big and bad enough to do. You know, I would jump downstairs. You know, I'd, you know. So, so you're saying that you were given opportunities to really... Uh, be free with yourself and express yourself. Yes, no, was. no limitations. No, 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 no limitations. As a matter of fact, I don't think I was aware of you know bl my blindness and um, you know what what that meant in you know today's vertical society. So I, I just lived. I just lived like any other kid. That that's interesting. So who takes credit for that? Your mom. That's, the, that's in the, my family. Co that's in my yeah. family. My mom. Uh, my mom obviously. My my mom's. If, my mom is is a rock in so many ways and my father my father was just the most loving individual my wow. father was my google before ever there was google he had <laughs> answers to all the questions i would ask and you know so my family my siblings you know we fought hard we played hard so i think my family i'm i'm a product of love so we did we didn't have a lot of money but there was a lot of love and, that, that, um, that's, that's that very me. interesting i'm, yeah, I'm so. almost feeling jealous because uh, <laughs> <laughs> i grew up in in a polygamous household and I won't really say that love was flowing that much. You have to look for love, you know, and all that. Uh, sh should I then assume, Kobams, that um, because you grew up in that kind of a very loving family, loving neighborhood and all that, everybody gave everybody a chance, um, did you grow up feeling entitled to love? Uh, you know, even just love generally and then love from the opposite sex or did you think you are not entitled and you have to you know look for it uh, that, that, that's interesting so i i, I also grew up a dreamer hmm. and the thing is when you're a dreamer the world is your oyster you um you kind of create so i lived in two worlds one of them was obviously the barracks where i grew up you, you know, which yeah. was in a sense squalid malignant it was it was crazy i knew you know, friends who would grow up to do bad things. I knew people who wouldn't go to the university, and it was just sort of set in stone from the beginning, you know, and all that. But at the same time, I lived in an alternate universe of books. 
where I was this person, you know, in a different, more palatial, you know, more, it, just a totally different environment, you know, etiquette and ethics and all of those things because I read and I kind of lived in that world. So I think I, 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 I combined the love I received from my family. And I don't know if the neighborhood in itself was necessarily loving. It was, you know, it was full of activity and my family yeah. was loving. But the neighborhood was interesting. And I use that as a blanket word. But um, I think I was able to draw love from my alternate world, which was made up of listening to shortwave radio and BBC and Deutsche Welle and all of that stuff and reading books and, so, you know, my family as well. So that was something you created, you know, intentionally for yourself, reading books, listening to radio, and getting that uh, a, a different sense of you, and that that's that's very interesting. And I'm sure there's a lot to learn from that. That you you can create your own world and create uh, um, you know a different world and the way you, you see yourself. Can. You said yeah. you can. Now now, Kubams, let's let's get to uh, dating. You know, mm. um, you know, the grapevine has it that. Growing up, your university days, uh, you you had your A game on, hmm. you know, <laughs> you didn't allow anything to stop you from, you know, dating and you you, you could almost qualify for a player if I can say. Oh that. wow, God bless the grapevine. <laughs> we have to set the grapevine on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so is it true that Kobams was a player? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think I don't think I was a player. I dated actively though. I did it actively, um, but I, I wouldn't qualify myself as a player. Um, I, so first of all, I don't think you know players are romantic by nature. I don't know, you know, based on you know what I know from movies and you know may, maybe just people and stories and stuff. I don't I don't know that players are romantic. I'm a hopeless diehard romantic, you know, but I did date actively. I'm not one of those people who would say to you, you know, so I dated and married my first love. My wife did, fortunately, for her. <laughs> um, you know, fortunately for me, too. But, um, yes, I, I did. I dated actively. That, that, that's interesting. So there's a part of Cobams that we're not aware of. That's that hopeless romantic uh, Cobams. And I, I hope as we go on, we're going to unfold that, you know, a, a little bit more. All right, so Cobams... Um, you know, typically they say that visually impaired people see with their hands, you know, mm. and all that. So did you do a lot of seeing ladies with your hands? <laughs> or do you have a different way of, of getting the sense of beauty and all that? How, how, how did that work for you? I would have lawsuits flying left, right, and <laughs> center. <laughs> okay, so for me, you know, it, it's interesting how, how I, I think with life, you know, there's there's a spirit it, it's just a question of whether or not we choose to be willing to listen but i think that there's a spirit that guides us um to make you know the right decisions i know that you know as men we're highly visual but yeah. sometimes you know you make decisions based on a leading and i think for me that's always sort of been the case in my life i was able to um define and i think maybe the lack of sight might have helped in this but i was able to define beauty differently and you know for me you know beauty especially in a relationship between you know two people is low drama um, yeah. is, um and i think kindness kindness so kindness to other people besides myself was for me a very 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 important prerequisite because my mother and my sister I feel like are two people who taught me kindness and so you know when I relate with a person I'm always you know one of the first things that comes to mind for me is is this person kind do I feel like you know you're a, you're a kind person everything else we kind of walk our way around and then in terms of you know just like the physical uh, you know the physical engagement and all of that people don't realize that they give out a lot of information in conversations so i'm sitting down and a friend comes in maybe a female friend and my friends go or i'm looking for someone in like or someone is looking for you know a female friend and someone goes i ah, she's the one that is tall and light and wears glasses and in my, in my mind i'm like okay she's tall she's light she wears glasses or oh, she's short she's dark she so you pick a lot of cues from what people so say I pick, yeah i pick cues from what people say and that kind of influences you know um, um, what's important to me. However, yeah. you know, you know I, I look at it and, and you know, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get to this as we progress. You know, what, what is important to me is oftentimes not, you know, generally what is assumed to be um, the, the most important physical attributes because conversations, you know, conversations, for instance, I'm, I'm big on good conversations. I'm big on how a person sounds, you know, and things like that. So those I can ju judge or gauge myself. And then so I'm the ability there. to talk, 
hold a conversation, tone of voice oh, that, and stuff that's like in, that. That's important. Those too. things are so are you saying that you don't have physical specs? You know, like guys have specs. Uh for you know, some guys who like it like very robust or slim or you know, all those kind of stuff. I've been accused by men and women yeah. of having specs. Largely because most of the women I dated uh, during my courtship days happened to, for some reason, reasons I still don't yet know, happen <laughs> to look alike. Interesting. So, so people generally assume that I like to date, you know, tall, slim women. Mm. I don't know that this is true. I don't know this is. It's probably one of the biggest coincidences in my life. Um, <laughs> so I think for me, the the first thing I I no, is, is it the first thing I, I looked out for then was a great conversation. Mm. I need to be able to have a great conversation with you and feel like we're both in that conversation. Um, I need to feel like you know we have certain likes. I think music was also important to me then. You know, I need to feel like you I know, was going to talk about that. Music. That music has to come in somewhere. Yeah, we're music al is already talking about tone of voice, you know, and what, all that. What I found shocking, though, PG, was the fact that the first day I met with Jola, she told me she didn't like music, <laughs> and that troubled me. <laughs> but then she but was singing on forward. the phone. Yeah, yeah but what? I I was contemplating, but then she she was singing. Oh, not the, not the first day, the first long phone conversation we had. But then she was singing on the phone, and I was like, "How can you say you don't like music and you're singing?" But then I eventually figured what it was for her that she wasn't obsessed in the way that I was with music. But yes, that's, music is a very important part of it for me. That, that that's interesting. So we've been having uh, a great discussion with Kobams Asuko. The title again is "Love Is Not Blind." I'm going to take a short break, and when I'm back, we're going to take this discussion in a slightly different direction. You don't want to miss this, so stay with me. I'll be right back. Welcome back. We've been discussing Love is Not Blind, and my guest on this episode has been Kobams Asuko, the multi-award winning artist, singer, producer, musician. And uh, we're, we're going to dig deeper uh, looking at uh, Kobams. What is the most important attribute that you were looking for in a spouse you know uh, we've talked about your dating days and you've told us about you know tone of voice love for music and all that but taking it beyond just a bay and boo kind of relationship we're not talking about my spouse what would you say is your most important attribute that you were looking out for so for me obviously by this time you know like i said i dated actively and um I dated a number of women, um, some of them feisty, some of them, well, maybe a bit more docile and just easy, you know. Um, I think I had established a number of things by this time, one of them being that I know that I'm on my way somewhere, and I figure that it was important for me to find someone who would understand and appreciate where I was trying to go and because I was trying to go involved a certain level of greatness, it was important to me to find someone who would treat people with kindness because I was aiming in life for a position of elevation. I was aiming for a position of, of greatness. And generally because of you know, my, my, my makeup, my disposition, I feel like when you're in a position of greatness, it then falls on you more than it does on others to treat people with kindness because you happen to be the one there. And I, I think for me it was important to find someone who naturally understood that and not someone who was just kind to me because it's easy to be kind to me, I know where I'm going and you know, and by, you, by this time a number of things had begun to happen for, for me in life. But I needed someone who would be kind to my friends, kind to my family, kind to other so, people who so may not So for you, be. kindness is, uh, is, is the main thing? Yes sir, yeah. kindness. Kindness is really, 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 really important, important to me. Knowing that you're shooting for greatness and when you get to that great height, uh, people just want to see a kind person and a kind spouse who yes. will portray what is really in your heart. Because I would take a lot of advice from my spouse and it's important yeah. that if I'm leaning to you for advice, I can trust that you will give me something that comes from the kindness of your heart and not necessarily from how you feel. Because if it comes from how you feel, then I'm bound to make a lot of stupid decisions that are based on how you feel and not based on what is necessary. Because people are going to make you feel a certain type of way anyway. 
and it was important for us not to react based on how we, we feel. feel. That, so, that, yeah. that's, that's very enlightening and um, I love that. Now, Kobams, how did you meet Ojola and um, yeah. how did you propose? Let's take it two in one. Okay. How did you meet her? How did you propose? So I met Ojola at a library. <laughs> we were both studying to go to the university. I had a, I mean, th there was really no, no need for me to be in that library, quite honestly. I had a, f a fully funded scholarship to study um, in a university called Mercer in Macon, in a small t in a town called Macon in Georgia. She was um, preparing, you know, for her SATs and all of that to to go to school in the states. Um, as it would happen, I ended up losing my scholarship, and she ended up going to the states. <laughs> Long story, but we met in that library. Uh, in the public affairs section of the United States Information Service then um, around that CMS um, waterboard area and she had come in and wanted to sit beside me and she had said excuse me and I said you're excused actually meaning she was excused but she thought I was being rude <laughs> so um, she eventually squeezed past me and sat down and um, I was typing on my computer you know studying my SATs and all that and at a point she asked me if I knew a certain another common friend of ours so I went to KC she went to QC I was familiar with a lot of the QC people okay. um, you know KC and QC you always just generally had yeah. a thing and yeah. so she you know she asked me if I knew someone and I said oh yes I do and she was like oh you're the cop house she was gushing about and I was like uh -huh. you know so we got talking from there on we weren't supposed to be talking it was a library but I'm glad <laughs> we did because we became friends and then she gave me her number and I memorized it and I was supposed to call her later but I didn't call her until three days after that day then i called her yeah and we spoke on the phone the whole day and wow. the next day we spoke on the phone the whole day and the wow. next day we spoke, and it was nightel days you know landlines <laughs> and by the time our bills would come out like we had six digit bills in those days wow which was ridiculous ridiculous, ridiculous. <laughs> okay so Kubam, there was definitely a spark at that point where you guys started to have unending conversations with uh, you know big budget phone bills there was a spark there was a spark definitely from me but not from her <laughs> at least okay. as as far as i reckon i so after our first conversation on the phone um we got off the phone and i was i found myself dialing her number almost immediately and you know i said to myself this is this is not right you shouldn't be doing this you're young you should you know maintain your dignity you're giving away too much you know mm -hmm. If she picks up the phone, what are you going to say? You're not looking cool. And she picked up the phone and I said to her, you know, I don't know why I'm calling you back right now. I just got off the phone, but I just really felt this urge to call you. Look, you can think of me as uncool or whatever you want, but I, I was just going to call you and I just followed my heart. And she was like, you know what? It's not a problem. I was actually going to call you too. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> and it's weird, but at that point, I instantly felt like I needed to marry this girl. Wow. And I, I told her about a month later, and as soon as I told her, she said her, 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 her tummy was hurting her, which was very upsetting for me. <laughs> because, and for her, she's like, usually she felt that she would feel that way when she was, you know, getting some news that she didn't particularly like. Yeah. So that troubled me, because she had friend zoned me. So, you know, I was her friend, yeah. and um, nothing more. Her best friend, pretty much. We're building, you know, a friendship. Yeah. And so I went on to date a couple other women after that time. After she said she wouldn't. So yeah. after the, you know, friend zoning you, you, you kind of just moved on slightly. I, yes, I, I, I did. And, you know, I, I, I take flack for that every time I tell the story. But, you know, I think about it and I'm like, well, she had clearly told me she wasn't going to date me. Yeah. You know, and, you know, just being the person I am, you know, I'm, I'm a romantic. I, I like to give love. I like to share love. I like to be in that space where I know that, you know, I'm loving someone and all that. And she yeah. had clearly told me, you know, she wasn't going to be that person. So I went ahead and dated someone, you know, it was a relationship from the first six months. I wasn't sure it wasn't really going to work, but just because I can be diehard, I, I stuck it through for like another two and a half years or something. <laughs> but she was my friend. We would talk and everything. And every time, you know, I, I broke off of a relationship, I'd go to her and say, will you date me now? She'd be like, no, I've told you, you're my brother, you're my friend, I can't date you. <laughs> and I'd be devastated. 
and I would wow. date someone else. And you know, wow. this happened for a while. And I had, you know, a couple of great relationships and met great people, you know, in the process. Um, so generally, God, God just, you know, brings me to really nice people. Nice. And I, I did meet a number of great people. But, um, you know, after like two, two, two relationships and maybe six or seven years later, I was like, you know what, this thing isn't going to work. Six this or is, seven years later? Yes. Sir. Wow. That means this really dragged. And so, so tell us, after six or seven years, how did you get back to asking Ojola again? So she left for America and I stayed in Nigeria. I was working, just doing all kinds of things and, you know, just, um, so it, 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 you know, a lot had changed. And then she came back to Nigeria after school. Yeah. And, you know, we were friends by this, you know, by this time I was, you know, out of uh, a relationship. And, you know, I, I would say to her from time to time, look, I'm working hard and, you know, for me, there's got to be a purpose for this, all of what I'm doing. And I don't want to be a rich, miserable bachelor. <laughs> I want you to come and share my life with me. And she'd be like, look, I'm just your friend. Let's forget this thing. And I think two years in, you know, she, um, she so, so once, That's once two we, years in after she got back. Thereabouts. Yeah. So, we, so one time we dated for 19 hours. She said to me, okay, let's give this thing a try. And like 12 hours into it, she's like, I'm not so sure. You know, don't tell anybody we're dating yet. <laughs> I was just devastated. But we, we stayed friends. Like we would pray, we would talk out close from work and go and pick her up. We, we, we were friends. We were really close. But we just didn't have the official tag that we were an item. And so, you know, Two, um, two years into her coming into town, um, she decided to give it a try. And this time when she said, let's date, I disappeared for three days. I didn't let her see me. I was like, at least if I come and after three days we break up, it would have been longer than the first time. <laughs> so I disappeared for like three days and eventually, you know, we got together and it was, it was easy. It was easy. You know, we had our ups and our downs, just discovering each other, just getting to know, you know, who we are, our temperaments and all that. So, so how did you propose? Her, her family was traveling for her sister's vacation, her sister's graduation. Okay. And I was um, traveling on holidays. Okay. I was going to see my sister and, you know, do a couple of things. So um, we happened to travel together to the States. Okay. And um, by this time, I was clear. I knew that, you know, I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. Yeah. And so I f um, her family flew out to L.A. from Houston. Yeah. So I flew to L.A. to meet her father. Yeah. And I will backtrack a little. So before we, before we even started dating, I would fly out of Lagos on the first flight Saturday morning to Abuja mm. to hang out with her and spend time with her and fly back to Lagos on Saturday evening. Yeah. And I used to do this nearly on a weekly basis at a point. Wow. You know, because I, I, now it was imperative that I got her to see what it was I saw and how we were both meant to be in each other's lives. You know, just So you things. really invested a lot into this. I did, I did, I did. I I I chased I ch I chased her. It's such a story. So I'd go out and I'd see her and I'd come back. And well, we were just friends, you know, we'd hang out and we used to prayer walk, you know, we'd go to like a park in Abuja and we'd prayer walk and we'd talk. And I'm like, how can I not marry this person? You're my best friend. This is how we spend time. This is how, you know, we love being with each other. I would land and we'd literally get on the phone and talk for hours. And I'm like, and you're saying we should not get married. Like, it didn't make sense to me. Kovam says, it looks like you have to make a movie out of this story. <laughs> you know, this, uh, uh, it's just looking like an unending romantic I adventure, know, you know? I know. And I'd say to her, so, you're my best friend. I'm your best friend. We, we should be together. That's the condition under which we should really be together. And then, um, so I'd gone to LA to see her father and tell him I wanted to marry her. And um, he was like, okay, that's fine, I hear you, um, but come and talk to me and my wife in Nigeria. And so they flew back from LA and I flew to Lagos. Yeah. And her father and her mother were like, well, you know what, let's talk about this in Abuja. So they flew to Abuja where they were living and I flew <laughs> out to Abuja. <laughs> and I got to the house and waited for hours and eventually had a conversation with them about it. And her mother was like, look, we need to pray about this. Ojola's mom is a praying woman. Yeah. She's, you know, she's, she's the loveliest. Yeah. And I think she's a reflection of the person that Ojola is, you know, in many senses. Yeah. You know, and so she said, let's pray about it and blah, 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 blah. And then, yeah, you know, they took time and I just waited and waited and waited. And eventually when it seemed like, you know, there was going to be a go, while I was in the States, I bought a ring, which I hid from her. She didn't know, you know, existed. And um, one 
um, one Valentine morning, I told her I wanted us to go out to IITA in Ibadan. I just discovered the place then. Someone told me it was really great. It had, you know, a fishing lake and all of that. So we needed to go somewhere different, you know, to just, you know, just be together and then drive back in the evening. Yeah. So we went there. And um, we had a great time, you know, the buffet was great and everything, we just generally, so first of all, they wanted to turn us back and I was like, oh no, these people shouldn't destroy my plans. But they let us in. And then um, we just hung out, you know, walked around the grounds, you know, talked about the place and everything. And um, later that evening, we went prayer walking by the lake and we were just, you know, just praying and walking and everything. And, you know, when we, when we got done and um, I stopped and my heart was pounding. And um, I got down on one knee and she couldn't believe it. And I pulled the ring out of my pocket. And I was like, you know, I know this, I know this is crazy and you probably didn't imagine that this would come now and all that, you know, and, but will you marry me? I expected her to say no. Wow. Um, I re I expected after her all to, that you've After done? everything, I expected <laughs> her to say no. And yeah. um, she said yes. Wow. And the most amazing, the most embarrassing thing happened to me right there at that moment. So in my mind, Which I like is. to think of myself as, I'm a G, I'm the guy, you know, and everything. <laughs> and as she said yes, I just started to cry. Wow. It, wow. Was, it was so embarrassing wow. because I'm not that guy. I don't break down and cry <laughs> easily, but I think it must have been the relief, the relief. you know. And after all, the after all these years and everything. miles upon miles. <laughs> yeah, so I just started to cry, and I think that confused her. <laughs> <laughs> as it would any any woman and wow. you know and so that was pretty much how i proposed and then you know we we phoned our families and let them know came back that's, to lagos and you know that's that, that's very very interesting uh, <laughs> we've been having a great discussion with kubams asuko love is not blind that's the episode and um it's obvious that we cannot exhaust all that we have to discuss in this episode so we'll continue uh, this discussion uh, in the next episode of the Better Half Show. May your relationship and marriage be sweet. <laughs>